much as that light. Which meant that photographers were required to schlep gargantuan box cameras into the field and spend enormous amounts of time coating their wet plates before they could even expose them. In all, it took a photographer anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes to make a single picture. When Matthew Brady or one of his assistants, like Gardner or O'Sullivan or Pywell, tried to take pictures of the battles, they invariably took pictures after the battles, when all the newsworthy events had already come and gone. All they could do was picture the aftermath, the dead bodies, the empty bridges, the sites once crowded but empty. Their practice, we might say, was filled with loss. I take this photograph, which we've seen now already, by Gardner to be evidence of the photographer's self-consciousness of the fact of his perpetual belatedness. <laughs> the picture is the first plate in his famous photographic sketchbook of the war, which appeared in 1866, just after the war had ended, and is meant to open the story of the war. If one were to ask historians today, what event might mark the opening of the war, all kinds of answers could be given, although I would guess that a major candidate would be the first shots fired at Fort Sumter in January 1861. I dare say hardly anyone would pick this scene, the Marshall House in Alexandria, Virginia, in which a colonel, in May 1861, not a day or a week or a month, but five months after the opening barrage at Fort Sumter, was shot and killed when he brashly attempted to take down the Confederate flag. And in any case, the actual shooting is not pictured, nor the flag, nor the colonel, nor any details suggested the killing or its significance. We are left merely with a building, where we are told something once happened. It seems already a commemorative site, a place for the tourists to visit and ponder, and for the narrative of the war to exist as available only through the nostalgia or loss offered by the picture. Or take this photograph by Timothy O'Sullivan, plate 22 of Gardner's book. O'Sullivan took this picture when the Battle of Antietam had already passed, yet it did not stop him from asking his subjects to strike poses as if they were witnessing the battle and pretending to relay information about troop movements to their commanders in the fields beyond. One man holds an eyeglass as if he were spotting the enemy, although during the actual camera shoot, he was probably looking at empty space, even, or even more fittingly, at a place where the enemy had been long before. In all this, he was most like a photographer. Civil War photographers often anticipated that their work would become the key elements of historical recall and fashioned pictures to match those needs. As I am suggesting, some photographers built an understanding of that historical labor into their pictures. It's up to us to recognize their strategies. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to talk about a little bit is um, 
the use of photography during the Civil War and the sort of Civil War era um, as propaganda. Um, and I, I think that anti-slavery activists were arguably some of the first modern humanitarians in the sense of the way in which they launched their um, campaign against um, slavery. I mean, in the way, I think we can recognize some things in their strategies that you can still see in humanitarian campaigns today. I don't know if you're familiar with the um, CNN Freedom Project. I don't know if it's still going on, actually. I was living abroad last semester, so I didn't speak the language in, in Austria, so I was watching a lot of CNN International and got a barrage of Freedom Project stuff. So, um, But the Freedom Project um, claims to, quote, um, be joining the fight to end modern-day slavery and shine a spotlight on the horrors of modern-day slavery, amplify the voices of the victims, highlight success stories, and help unravel the complicated tangle of criminal enterprises trading in human life. And so they, they try to illustrate ways um, in which we are all implicated in modern-day slavery. So they have stories um, such as, quote, your tomatoes possible ties to slavery. All right, so they're, they're really trying to, to make that link between the, the couch potato and, the, and, and slavery. Um, and so I think 19th century abolitionists were trailblazers in this respect. Um, they did, they staged boycotts of slave-produced products, slave-produced cotton, sugar, things like that. They wrote exposés, um, uh, just as CNN is now um, broadcasting, about the abuses suffered by enslaved people um, in the South. But they also knew um, very early on that the key to capturing people's sympathies was to shrink the distance between the enslaved and, and the, the free. So to, to, to so the, the free people, and mostly free white middle class people, but not entirely, exclusively that group, um, would, would see some um, uh, a stake in, in the fight against uh, slavery. So they, they quickly figured out, abolitionists did, that, that the relatively new medium of photography was an ideal vehicle for this. And so that through photography they might reach a, a broader public, but also to change, change people's minds. Um, all the images I'm going to show you were commissioned by abolitionists, um, anti-slavery activists. Um, what you're not going to see here, except for the last image I'm going to show you, are pictures of um, black slaves, or even people that look like they might have been enslaved. Um, and that was the genius of this particular appeal, was that the people in these photographs looked like white, middle-class, Victorian um, children. They looked like the people that the abolitionists were trying to reach. Um, um, and Josh Brown has already given us sort of an introduction to the history of photography. Um, this is a daguerreotype. So this was taken in the 1850s, in the 1850s. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk about it here because it sort of um, was a, an important predecessor to some of the Civil War era pictures that I'm going to show you. Um, so with, with daguerreotypes, you usually just had one, one version of a photograph. You couldn't mass produce it. Um, uh, like you could a carte de visite, which we've seen some of. Um, so this is a photograph of a little girl named Mary Botts, uh, and it was taken in eight, around 1854, and it was really sort of a direct result of the Fugitive Slave Act, which was passed in 1850, um, which made it a felony to aid fugitive slaves, among other things. So the Fugitive Slave Act sort of outraged anti-slavery activists in the North anyway. It basically said, you're now implicated in the system. It made them angry um, and uh, spawned things like Uncle Tom's Cabin and then from Uncle Tom's Cabin more fiction, um, uh, sentimental fiction that was supposed to sort of pull people's heartstrings and get them uh, interested in, in, the, in the fight against slavery. So photography was sort of an ex using photography in this way sort of an extension of that. Um, the father of Mary Botts was a fugitive slave. He was living in Boston and, and freed managed to free his family, raised enough money to free his family with the help of some prominent people. And this was a, excuse me, a photograph taken of his middle child, Mary. And I think it really sort of marked a new direction for the, for the movement in that it, it so economically sort of erased the distance between white Northerners and Southern, southern slavery. So um, uh, I said abolitionists commissioned all these pictures. This one in particular was taken or um, was commissioned by Charles Sumner of Massachusetts. 
um, the senator, and um, he, um, uh, in, the, in the letter, he, he, he sent a letter to several newspapers and, and declared her um, bright and intelligent, another Ida May. I think her presence among us in Boston will be more effective than any speech I can make. Ida May was a fictional child. Um, she was a white child who was um, kidnapped and enslaved in South Carolina. And everybody in New England was reading anti-slavery fiction who knew who Ida May was. Um, this child was not white. She had been a slave. Her father was a fugitive slave. She was still a slave in Virginia until he managed to have her um, free. So Sumner, I think, pretty quickly realized the, what the appeal would be to have a photograph of this child taken. So he, he requested her daguerreotype be made um, as, quote, an illustration of slavery. Okay? And, he, and he makes it available to, to Massachusetts senators and stuff. Um, the New York Daily Times declared her, quote, one of the most indisputable white children that we have ever seen. The Liberator characterized her image as, quote, a portrait of a most beautiful white girl with high forehead, straight hair, intellectual appearance, and decidedly attractive features. Uh, and then his letter that, that, that he published, Sumner, that Sumner published, he said, let a hard-hearted hunker look at it and be soft. So he clearly understood, I think, uh, and he's talking about the photograph there, not the girl. Right? She, <laughs> she gets, gets toured around and all that, but he's talking about the photograph. Um, so I think photographs of Mary Botts, or Ida May, as, as, her, as, her name was, as she was known to the public, um, uh, it was combined with that well-known story. And it played on fears that slave catchers would, um, could take white children into slavery if, if the slave power wasn't held in check. So you start to see more of those stories in, 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 the, in the press, although they're kind of specious, but you start to see more of it. So it's, but it's also a critique of the system of slavery that would produce a child that looked like a white child, right? Um, so this, I think, as far as I can determine, was sort of the first photograph like this of a, of a, a white-looking child um, who had been enslaved and was produced for um, abolitionist purposes. And then there were lots of descendants of um, Mary Botts or, or Ida May. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. Um, these are parts of his beat, which means that um, they were fairly cheaply reproduced and could be bought um, um, fairly cheaply. And this girl, Rebecca, you can see at the bottom, an emancipated slave from New Orleans. Um, and she was photographed in New York. There was a whole group of um, freed people, mostly children from New Orleans, who were taken north on tour during the Civil War. This is about 1863, 1864. Um, uh, and, and their portraits were, were made. And there, there, there are lots of different poses, so we know that they took a lot of pictures of these children. Um, and so the question that was raised earlier um, about distribution and reception is, is interesting. I mean, there are a lot of, of these images in archives. And archives all over the all over the place, not just one archive, and lots of different poses. Um, the proceeds of these photographs went to the education of free people in Louisiana. The <coughs> Union was already occupied um, New Orleans by this point, so they were produced to raise money for that effort. But they were, I think, also produced um, because it come, they come out in the middle of the war in 1863. The support for the war is kind of waning in the North. Um, and I think that these, these photographs had a lot more to say um, about, um, uh, um, or they had a message that was sort of aimed to bolster um, Sagan's support of the war. So in other words, if slavery isn't stopped now, right, um, uh, children like this child, who looks like a white child, um, will, will be vulnerable. Or at the very least, um, they will become the concubines of Southern planters. And so that's, um, one of the interesting things about the choice, the mostly photographed little girls, um, uh, most of the photographs of this group are of um, the light-skinned little girls. And that's because when 19th century viewers looked at these images, um, they were already, they, they had a story already attached to, to the notion of a very light-skinned female slave. 
and that they were very high in value in the South, that they became cocky <coughs> of, of, of planters. Um, and so this was an effort to sort of say, you, know, you can intervene. Right? This child looks like she could be in your photograph album, um, but she was a slave and there are other girls like this in the South, so you have the power to do something about it. Um, so this sort of appeal through the, the vulnerable, bo vulnerable body of a, a white-looking um, girl. Now, the question is, well, how do we know that this is the way people uh, during the Civil War were reading, um, reading these images? We, we have some evidence of the public appearances of girls like Rebecca um, and what was said at those public appearances by people like Henry Ward Beecher. Um, and the sorts of things he's saying is just what I've just described to you, which is that she's going to be a, um, the object of sin if you don't step in. Right? You know, look at this child, you know what her future is. I mean, he's really saying these things. So I think people were also reading these photographs um, in, in a similar way. Um, way. Here's another from the same, that same series of photographs. Um, this is Isaac and Rosa. There were, there were three very white-skinned children and two less white-skinned children, Isaac being the darkest um, in skin color, who were part of this group from, from Louisiana. I think this picture in particular was, uh, was really um, strategic. It's a very economical argument um, about a lot of things about the sort of spectrum of race that slavery has produced or racial features if you want to say it that way um, uh, and we know that although if you first glance you look at this photograph and you're a 19th century person you, you say well, that's a white child and a black child but people would have known that she wasn't white there wouldn't have been any question that she was white because she wouldn't be standing arm in arm with a black child in this, in this way. Um, and so um, I think that the, this picture of an Isaac and Rosa you know, had a very sort of pointed, uh, pointed message um, uh, behind it. So again, this notion of um, uh, 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 appealing, appealing to maybe white middle class viewers' ideas um, uh, about um, slavery by using sort of it's sort of a radical use of convention, I think. They're using studio portraiture, they're dressing the children in, in very, you know, sort of middle class looking clothes. This is not, the sort of image you're not seeing here, sort of like the image that Anthony was showing us, is of the ragged slave child, right? Um, Topsy would have been, if you if you had said, I'm going to show you a, an image of a slave child at this period, people might have expected to see Topsy. Um, this is not what they would expect to see. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> this this last pair of images um, uh, is sort of the direction I think that sort of reform photography takes um, after the Civil War. This image is is about the same period of time as the the, the portrait of Rebecca and the portrait of Isaac and Rosa, about eighteen. Um, uh, but but this I think um, and, and witness again the, the photograph that, that Anthony was talking about um, this was more the trend that, that would follow um, from the Civil War and um, and later and I think here it's kind of hard people um, generally would have seen this one and this one right you go back and forth <laughs> before and after before. And here again, I, I want to argue that I think that the anti-slavery um, uh, activists really very quickly harnessed the power of photography. Um, in, in this case, I think it's sort of early advocacy um, documentary kind of photography, um, this notion of before and after, um, uh, and the magic of the camera, of course, um, that, that these children um, uh, and, and they're very clearly sort of, it's, it's very staged um, in terms of them both standing in the, in the, in the, um, in the same studio, but, but taken at slightly different angles, so you don't really notice that they're in the, in the same space, right? but, but, but moving from sort of rags to 
respectability right, within, the, within the course of this photography. Um, so again, the picture that people would have expected to see would be um, uh, of enslaved people would have been that this sort of um, ragged, ragged um, image. Um, but but here they're making the argument that um, don't worry <laughs> that 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 former slaves, particularly children, um, can be transformed into respectable, industrious, um, educable. Um, uh, and that this new generation um, uh, uh, was was something to be positive about um, rather than rather than, than negative. So, um, what's um, you know what's the legacy of all this? I think, um, uh, as I said, I think this photograph, this is para photograph, um, reflects what what comes later. I mean, there are. Um, British photographers in the 1870s that are famous for taking these kind of before and after pictures. I think those might even be more familiar than, than this one, but I, I tend to think that it was actually anti-slavery activists who took the first kind of before and after um, uh, picture, right? So sort of setting in motion this new kind of photographic humanitarianism. And then, um, but of the, the, the other children, um, they haven't gotten very much attention um, from historians until fairly recently. Um, part, of, part of that, I think, is because immediately after the Civil War, they had no more utility. That nobody wanted to see um, white-looking people who, could, who had been enslaved who could pass for white. That wasn't an image that was going to help reformers, and it certainly wasn't an image of people who were opposed to the sort of equality of, of, of African um, Americans. And I'll say that um, uh, uh, Mary Boss's photograph in particular was unidentified. She was identified as a slave child uh, in whom the governor of Massachusetts was interested. And that's how she existed in the archives until 2007, um, until I was able to piece together some of the documentation or surrounding her story and give her and actually give her a name. But if you know about the daguerreotypes in, in archives, um, it's very hard to, you can't inscribe on the surface of a daguerreotype very easily. Like you can't really hard to physique. People can make notes and tell you what these are. With daguerreotypes, that's not the case. So she could have just as easily existed in the archives unidentified, you know, under the assumption that she was a middle class white child. We wouldn't have known the difference. So it's very, it's very um, uh, slippery in that way. Um, but I think in terms of the Civil War that, um, that we don't remember, I think there's a whole sort of um, uh, set of ideas about um, children and about race and about photography um, that haven't been part of that larger narrative. Okay, thank you. to see the work and, and the research of, of the, my colleagues here. And so, so, my, so my work is focusing on, I have images, and as a photographer, I'm always concerned about you getting the quality of, of the photograph, and, and so that's why I wanted it darker. But I want to I wanna talk about the, and, and thank you, Don and Josh, for inviting me to share um, this work. But I want to talk about this aspect of this pictorial record um, and a new memory of photography. And so I'm going to go through a lot of images and, and also think about how these images become um, standards for reimagining um, the images of, of black soldiers, specifically um, workers, but also to consider how they, I want us to think about the standard of how people were posed, um, what happened in front of the camera, but also to contemplate, uh, you know, just how we imagine this experience. So here, one of the early images. Um, this is an image that is seen as a banner. So when we think about how, how blacks were honored during this time, 
So this is the 24th Regiment of the U U.S. Colored Troops. The banner says, let soldiers, in, let soldiers in war be citizens in peace. So thinking about um, the difficulties that blacks had in volunteering for the Force Service, that um, eventually 180,000 um, troops were um, in, in service. But at the same, but during the early years, not until um, the activism of some of the of black activists as well as whites, did they enter into the service. But the photographs that were developed as a result of creating um, images of men who were seen, uh, who were some were formerly enslaved, some were uh, runaways and freed. But the fact that they decided to pose for the camera for, this is an 1864 photograph, the aspects of images that were, were presented included iconic symbolic images of the American flag, hand tinted with pistol, um, a painting in the backdrop of, of cannon, but also telling the story about bravery and, and how the poses um, were seen as significant. Um, Frederick Douglass was one of the um, voices in terms of creating um, the call for blacks to enlist in, in the service in the Union Army, but also he was conflicted because also his sons decided to join. We also see images that, that circulated, made by a black photographer here, um, John Brown by Augustus Washington, that as he's posed um, in prepared to salute, prepared to fight, prepared to make a difference. And so photography became kind of a, a storytelling moment for, for some of the people who posed. Um, this is a photograph of, of Lewis Douglas, Frederick Douglass' son, who was in the 54th Mass um, Infantry. That um, This is, was in the collection of Howard University. But here we begin to see as this photograph circulated, people um, talked about his pose. You know, that very rarely would you see a black man with such confidence in a posed image. So we see his, his cap, his arms folded, and then um, the whole aspect of how he is viewed in terms of a man, as, a base, as this is a, said, a manly man pose. Um, but it's fascinating when we begin to see how these stories were developed through the aspect of imaging, these images of, of black soldiers. Um, Martin Delaney um, also was a journalist and a physician um, later, but an activist um, against, um, in terms of fighting, and but also wanting to have a voice within, within the service. He eventually um, met with um, Lincoln and became um, an officer, rarely known, but with the colored troops, he was with the 52nd U.S. Colored Troops. He is posed here. Most of the photographs we know of Martin Delaney are illustrations and drawings. Rarely um, we find images and photographs. Um, we happen to see that earlier photograph. And we began to see how photography was central in documenting the, and how photography was used. So the roaming of the camera, the driver, the black figure that is included in, in this. These are images that are popular and well known, but I found it fascinating in terms of how do we reread these images. These recruits with um, standing with their rifles, but also um, in their uniform. They believed that they could die, they could kill for freedom, that they considered um, ways of, of contributing for their own freedom, even with um, the voices of with even working as laborers, the images posed as cooks, um, images as, as musicians, um, teamsters, um, as we see with uh, men who were um, leading the wagon train and, and carrying the wagon trains. Here we see some men posed outside of um, the, the slave auction house in, in Alexandria two men, um, their letters that men sent home to their families. So here again we see why 
the whole aspect of why they were fighting, so that their children could, um, could be free. They also um, fought, and their wives were also part of the discussion, where they were concerned that a white private earned $13 per month, the black soldier initially received only $10 a month, but $3 were automatically adopt, uh, um, deducted for, for clothing. So soldiers fought um, along with their wives, trying to get um, full pay. So I'm going to just go through some images that I've just found striking with the hand-colored, um, the seated pose, um, standing with their muskets, with pistols, um, looking daring and dashing, and, and the fact that this photograph circulated and, of course, was used and, you know, abused because of the carrying of um, the circulation of the image. So um, these images of, in terms of brotherhood, um, and then uh, there's in terms of bunkers, that they built the bunkers, they, um, they're placed outside, they're posed um, within, but they were also in terms of entertainment. Um, they were used, um, some of the black soldiers not only worked as laborers, but they were also used to entertain the troops. So this is cockfighting. Um, there is um, the aspect of, let's see, this is not the one, but there are other aspects of it. Here's one guarding the, the artillery, artillery um, pose, but also concerned about what happens next with their lives. They also, in terms of the aspects of the images of looking at um, the wagon train, that they had to build the railroads. They had to reinforce the railroads because they were destroyed by the Confederates. So the Union soldiers um, also were used to, as laborers, to create, um, to reinforce the railroads. As cooks again, and, and also within, in the South with, with cotton. So how they, um, their poles within the cotton but they were used to also pack and carry cotton later. Um, they, as I mentioned earlier, leading the wagon train, working, and then um, posed in different ways. And this is a, a young man who was um, seen as a deserter, and publicly, in terms of the hanging of, of this figure, it's a way of deterrent, of ways of fighting back and, and telling um, publicly that if this happens, you know, you will possibly run away. If you try to run away, that you will be killed. This is, his name is William Johnson, and this was made in 1864 in Petersburg, Virginia. So he um, was seen as a deserter. Um, as we see, there are other blacks in the backdrop. And what I found fascinating as I looked at images and um, for this talk, I found these faces. This is a runaway. Um, in the backdrop, in the background, where they found um, refuge in with these um, Union um, soldiers. Images such as this, um, they said that this is for the amusement of the children. Um, it was really fascinating to see, I think, uh, show the photograph of children, and here's a sense of playfulness. Um, letter writing, um, what I found also so important, these are white soldiers reading letters, um, but it was also bringing um, the war home to family members. And this exact same experience happened to black soldiers. I didn't find letters, um, they were reading letters, but I found moments where, you know, playing with the dog, pose as part of the movement. A woman within the scene outside of um, a prison of war. And then here again, yeah, women, part of the movement that Harriet Tubman was one of um, a significant person within the war as she was seen as um, used <clears throat> in terms of leading people. She was a nurse. She was also interested in you know, saving a number of, of the wounded black soldiers and creating monuments for them. Um, she worked in stores. She fed them. And so these are just, just some of the images that I just wanted to share um, 
housing. It took a long time for um, them to volunteer, to the volunteers to be accepted, and then also to be given guns. But then the photographers found it important to make these images, that they were part of this notion of their own, fighting for their own freedom. So the photographs were used. Um, this is a burial ground for, for blacks. Um, this is Susie King, who was also a nurse in, in the Army. And, and, and to find images of women actively um, working within this notion of, of the experience of freedom. That images such as this photograph here of Gordon, also known um, for with the anti-slavery movement, but also used when he ran away and, and, and some of the, and, and Louisiana and the the surgeons um, happened to see his back and, and decided to use this as an image to show the brutality of slavery. But also when, um, and it was really wonderful kind of how you use the two photographers because another group of photographers used this image as a deterrent for runaways to say this is could happen, this would happen in terms of punishment if you're found. So they were used, this photograph was used for, um, a, you know, for two purposes, dual purposes. And images such as this, a runaway slave ad, this is um, Dolly, this is in that, um, this was in Augusta, Georgia. She ran away on August 7, 1863. Um, it says her likeness is within. Um, she's 30 years old, light complexions, hesitate someone when spoken to, and is not a very healthy woman, but rather good looking with a fine set of teeth. Never changed her owner and has been a house servant always. It is thought that she had been enticed off by some white man, being herself a stranger to the city and belonging to the Charleston family of Manifold. So the Manifold family, when the Union soldiers um, entered into South Carolina, they decided to leave and, and move to Augusta, Georgia. Dolly was always a special person in, in Louis Manifold's life. So he also had her photograph. He had this part pasted on this lined paper, $50 reward, and this was in the police station of Augusta, Georgia. There are two possible accounts that the union